So you started out in business, I understand, selling magazines as a teenager. <laughs> right. uh, what, what, what's different about you? Why did you do that? Well, I guess I was just curious. I mean, I, I, mean, I would say there's two, uh, two sides of a coin. On one side, I have to say um, I was very curious about how to make some money and uh, <laughs> had uh, to see the financial freedom, as a teenager financial yeah, freedom. Yeah. I was interested in that. On the other hand, I saw, oh, okay, it was not that difficult. You know, it's really right. trying to organize things. So later you founded Hill House Capital Management right. yourself. Right. Alone, right? Uh huh. Why did you, how did you get the courage to do it? How did, why did you do that? Well, I think a couple of things. One, um, I wanted to do something I'm passionate about. I think yeah. uh, um, having sort of apply what I learned in an environment uh, that that fits what, where I want to go is very hard to go for a work somebody. So why don't I just Work, you know, start a company and focusing on what I believe in back then was to invest in China's emerging technology companies and the businesses. Yeah. So I thought that was my passion. I wanted to do that. And uh, the opportunity opens up. I got one investor. <laughs> I just think most young people today wouldn't think of starting. Uh, they can't imagine they could do that. Right. Oh, they, if you, you never know until you try. <laughs> yeah. So it was a you, you regarded it as a big gamble then, and uh, you didn't know that you could do it. Oh, I, I always kind of had the interest and confidence starting something. I tried actually a few other things before this. Some of them failed, some of them succeeded yeah. a bit. But in the end, I, I truly believe you have, you have to be a doer. You can't just be a thinker. You have to get started something. Well, I'm just, <laughs> academics are thinkers. Yeah, well, you are doing by <laughs> teaching. That's a different yeah, door right. system. Yeah. yeah. So you made it into a, a huge uh, financial uh, advisory company. And you have investors, are they from China exclusively, or are they from other countries as well? Yeah, or, or around the world, yeah. Y yeah, and so uh, what is your philosophy? Do you? Um, do you follow a formula? Uh, do you, or do you use personal judgment? And the, the philo the very simple. You want to learn the philosophy, come here to school of management, <laughs> <laughs> and, and also learn f from a cross well, street at the Yale Endowment. That's where uh, you learn well, the basics. My and students then, have started by taking my course online. Right, so. right. That's you know, if the, that's the first step yeah. <laughs> to, to to listen to you know uh, your class is a good idea. But well, but really, <laughs> it's about I think at the end of the day, it's it's about spotting those opportunities, applying common sense. Sometimes, um, you know, common sense is hard to uh, get by. Now, a lot of people have the impression that markets are efficient right. and that it's so competitive that you can't win at this game. But somehow you had confidence otherwise. Right. What, what gave you, why didn't you believe this efficient market story? Right, <laughs> oh, that was, I, I mean, that was, I, when I went to school here and was taught right market efficiency theory, but at the same time, it's a dynamic concept. There yeah. were so many conditions, assumptions on that market right, efficiency, right. and I think you know uh, the opportunity I spotted uh, back then about China's investment opportunities was so big, was such a transitional yeah. economy that you know that over time actually I developed my theory. Initially, I think uh, I you know I I would say. I thought myself as a value investing, as a conventional sense of value investing, which is more about discovering value. What are the value? Maybe, maybe, maybe that discovering value started from kind of cigarette bed, sort of a, uh, you know, deep value investing. Over time, I changed. I would say I, I'm more sort of in, not only about discovering value, but also about adding value and yeah. also about like investing in value not as a static concept, but a dynamic growth concept. So that's sort of my twist, if you will, on the sort of value investing uh, But philosophy. is your twist related to your personal ability to yes. judge people and business ideas? Right, yeah. I've just more, I think about myself not so much as an investor in a way. So I think about I'm a kind of entrepreneur who happened to be an investor. Well, you've been on the other side. Right. So I was thinking, you know, you know so that's really every time when I make a judgment, I'm not like, 
going through you know to the fat forces and you know all those uh, static business school case. Instead, I was like you know think about me starting that business. What's the essence of that business? What's the nature of that? The people behind the business. What are the drivers of his sort of ambition? What's you know and trying to understand better of the from first principles, not necessarily from a formula. That's how I started. But but still. Uh, how did you get started? In a sense, you have to find investors who wish, who believe in you from the beginning. Yeah. How did you do that? I, w I was lucky enough. I got convinced <laughs> David Swenson. <laughs> well, you were now, that's an interesting story, because right. you were uh, a, um, yeah. one oh, of his interns. Right, that's right. And in fact, you translated his book yeah. oh, well, into Chinese. That's right. His book was selling for $30 in the US after my translation sells for $5 in China. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that was a lot of value added. <laughs> so you were telling the world how you were going to do it, and you had, right? So you yeah. are following something like the Swenson approach. Yes, absolutely. I think in the end about that thinking about long-term orientation, that the, you know, the folks on the equity, folks on the uh, residual free cash flow of the nature of the business, and focusing on risk just returns. So that's what I learned yeah. from David. I mean, those are philosophies still very much the same core philosophy of what we do. But then I would say we combine that with actually a lot of Chinese philosophy. Uh, one thing I always talk about the, the sort of the Chinese Buddhism in a way talking about you know how do you do when thousands of drops of water you only need one bottle so you how do you think about that focus how do you think about uh, there's a, uh, sort of how do you win uh, a conventional or markets union and conventional thinking that's tourism thinking there's yeah. uh, also the thinking about, you know, how do you be focused and also have peace of mind, don't get bothered by the market movement. There are a lot of those philosophies, I would say, combined with what I learned here at School of Management and with David Swenson, I would say, those are forming the foundation of my, my investing philosophy. You've been through some big market movements in China. Right. Uh, you, how did that make you feel? How, it, that, like that, the market was going crazy. It must have seemed that way. Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think that's exactly the opportunity, right? So the when there's people chasing up and downs, when the when you know the uh, the volatility drives so much opportunity for long-term investors. So if you have long-term orientation, yeah. you should have an inherent advantage over other people. When I, I was asked actually to speak with the Chinese Fund Manager Association, they were yeah. talking about, you know, they're like, Lei, we, we love what you do about long-term investing, but you know, how, how do you make money, you know, despite being a long-term investor? <laughs> so, yeah. the, but that's the whole point, right? It's so like you want to be long-term because that's actually how you think you can make money. But did you sell uh, at, the, at the top in 2007? <laughs> um, I, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily know exactly, you know, uh, on like a whole portfolio because we're not ma market timer. Yeah. But we look at everything on bottom up basis. We look at every, some of them get overvalued that you would sell. Some of them yeah. actually, you know, you hold on to them over a long period of time. You look at our top holdings on the public equity portfolio. We have been there for, I would say, you know, 60, 70 percent of the names that we owned in the first couple of years. And after 10, 11 years, we still own them. And but you uh, said unconventional. Yeah. How do you make? How do you make sure that you're unconventional? How do you know? Right. I, I think well, a conventional thinking in China is that first you have to do market timing well. You have to do sector rotation. So you always follow the trend because China changed so fast. You can't yeah. be a, and you can't be a long term orientation because you know that's uh, just because the market yeah. changed so fast. Unconventional thing is that you know what. Actually, we could be a long-term orientation and hold on to very few names, uh, do a concentrated book instead of a very diversified uh, investment portfolio. Those are unconventional. Oh, so you weren't to... as diversified as no, other No, I firms. was not at all. I was, I was, you know, probably we own, you know, 10, 20 as a core names. Those, are, those make the and vast some of majority. Them, like, was it JD? Uh, well, JD was a private equity portfolio turned into a public equity portfolio. And, you know, some of companies like Gree and Media, the air conditioner company we own from the beginning. We own now 11 years, and they are still our top five holdings. 
Anyway, I wanted to ask you about philanthropy. Yes. You, you are a philanthropist. Yale is very grateful for your oh, gift. Thank you. What do you think? Is that, uh, is that something that's important to you uh, in, in your lives? And, what, and are you different from other people in your emphasis? Is it part of your philosophy that uh, is it, does it combine well with other things you do? I think, um, it's, I think it's a learning process for me. I think that's really the, you know, obviously to me, education changed my life. And it's had a, such a strong touch on what I do on every day. So my wife and I, when I, we reflect on that, I say, oh, how can other people benefit from our experiences? Yeah. And so that's why we set up, you know, school in China for underprivileged kids of a vocational schools. That's why we give scholarship inside inside China. Now we actually give uh, give actually the uh, set up the smaller uh, libraries for schools in Southeast Asia and India. And we, you know, that's what I, why we did what we, you know, did at Yale. So I think the way to make a connection to the people who have similar situations. And, and, I, and at the same time, I think China is in a cr critical crossroad. Uh, hopefully, there's a lot of first generation entrepreneurs uh, who made the money. Hopefully, by being an example in doing this, China could change to be, you know, European style kind of dynastic culture to be much more about this open culture so that I help with social mobility and help give people right. more chances. I think China is right now in that, this critical crossroad. That's great to hear. You were giving the idea of evolving Chinese culture and that uh, somehow philanthropy was different in older China, right? There was philanthropy all there along. Were, yeah, there was, yeah, there were a lot of philanthropy in different ways and throughout the culture, throughout the, you know, the, the but, Chinese civilization. But maybe yeah. it had a qualitatively different, like more emphasizing to one's family or to one's to, caste? Yeah, or? to one's cl uh, communities and also obviously to to be connected to the sort of the communities and the, the always being in the Chinese culture, the Confucianism, always the belief of giving and uh, but I think the recent decades obviously uh, had been uh, very hard for the Chinese because of the economic difficulties. Now this first, really the first generation entrepreneurs are shaping the Chinese culture. I think that uh, by being a role model for people, a lot of people who sort of uh, make, the, make the money and to say, oh, okay, there's a better way of using that money and to help the society. And I think that's, uh, that was a very rewarding experience. So you say it was important for you to, to visit the United States here at Yale for some years. Is that enriching experience? Oh, absolutely. I, I enjoyed it so much. I learned, I learned, I mean, not only about the, uh, you know, the knowledge and the instruments of financial instruments, but also the philosophy, the uh, thinking. I mean, that if you combine that with the, the sort of the Chinese philosophy, I think that ma makes perfect sense for me to form uh, my investing philosophy as well in my, in my life. We're trying to, with uh, Coursera, we're trying to right. uh, give an opportunity for people to uh, see other, many of our students are from other, other countries. Uh, what do you think about uh, where the, the social media, the online experience is, is changing the world? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that... Uh, uh, you know, uh, actually in emerging markets, this could have even deeper uh, sort of uh, implications because essentially you have the opportunity to leapfrog the traditional classroom and uh, the value added you could have to have world-class uh, faculty, world-class teaching uh, uh, transcending the current system. And I think that uh, given, and given that most of the uh, younger people in the emerging uh, markets also, you know, m many of them now have uh, smartphones that they have access right. to all those information. If somehow we can empower them, doesn't matter where they live in, you know, suburb of Indonesia or India or China or Brazil, people yeah. can benefit from that knowledge yeah. dissemination and it really empower them to, uh, to, uh, to really try something uh, 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 much better for themselves. This would help with the social mobility, help giving people right. the chance to succeed. So it sounds like you are talking about diversification into human capital. Right. Uh, 
a lot of people have, uh, maybe you'll tell me whether you agree, a lot of people have traditional views about how to invest. And they, they think of, say, real estate as a, as a sure bet. And they think of uh, taking a finance course as something kind of uh, <laughs> secondary. But it's, it's what, what, yeah, what do you there's, think? There's nothing better than investing in yourself and investing in education. And education investment over the long run always produces the best compounding results that you could yeah. never imagine. I think that you know that's for sure the best investment you could ever make on yourself, on your friends and your relatives and the society. I have a deep belief in that. I think there's uh, you know the we haven't even talked about externalities, right? Then we have a you know better educated society and that interact with each other can produce even more profound impact. I think yeah. so. We're just at, at 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 the beginning of the sort of the, the error that we can see how human capital can be harnessed better. I think there are two things going on. One is about uh, we have to be, there are two things that we should be mindful of. One is about technology change, a artificial intelligence, would that replace human capital or not? Right. Secondly, about the sort of uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the knowledge gap or digital gap between different classes, socioeconomic classes of people, especially in places like emerging markets where, where, where they don't have the same access for, yeah. the, for the people in the you know, suburb of Jakarta may not have the same access for the people in you know, uh, New Haven. So yeah. how do you bridge that gap? Because that actually, the digital gap actually got widened. So how do you bridge that gap? And also how do you think about technology not only you know, not as a sort of a disfranchising factor, uh, and actually as a equalizer, as an equalizer to help bring people together. Those are, those are things I'm very interested. 